except for the media people. It is on the. Uh, it is in his speech. Not for I saw it myself. The chairperson of the speech. It is a speech of President Sisi. I saw it myself. Not for You are kindly requested to be seated. For those who don't have a place, there is a... For those who cannot find seats down here, please, we still have empty seats in the gallery. We don't have room in the gallery, so those who don't have a sitting place, kindly move to the galleries. On parle de la sécurité, quelle sécurité y a-t-il Veuillez prendre vos places, s'il vous plaît. Il y a de la place dans les galeries.
S'il vous plaît, je voudrais pas porter à l'attention de tous. May I draw your attention on the fact that we have heads of state in this room and that security measures should be taken into account. Can you please clear the doors and entrance ways to enable the heads of state to get in the room. I just wanted to, to translate with my little English. This is a summit of heads of state and government. For security reasons, all the corridors are supposed to be vacant. These are international security rules. All the corridors must be vacant, please. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والآن نبدأ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم May we now start the opening session of the 33rd ordinary session the Assembly of the African Union and I would like to invite the participants to take their seats أولا وقبل كل First of all and as you all know, the African continent has recently lost one of his, of its children, one of the eminent sons, that is the former president, Arab Moy. I would like here yeah, to express my most heartfelt condolences to President Uhuru Kenyatta and the brotherly people of Kenya and I may his, rest, his soul rest in peace. I would like now to invite you to stand up to observe a minute of silence in his memory.
שוקרן לקום גמיאן. And the Prime Minister of Palestine, the Secretary General of the United Nations, the Chairperson of the African Union Commission, the Sec Executive Secretary of the East League of Arab States, and the heads of uh, regional economic communities and all the other institutions and organs of the African Union. Let me take this opportunity. to extend my congratulations to my brothers, His Excellency Mohamed Wultazwani, the President of the Islamic Republic of Mauritania, and His Excellency Qis Saeed, the President of Tunisia, and His Excellency Abdel Majid Tabun, the President of uh, the People's Democratic Republic of Algeria. We have been elected recently, and I would like to extend my consideration to the Ethiopian, our Ethiopian brothers for hosting this summit. We will start our opening session by listening to the African anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have a number of opening remarks, and we will start by hearing from His Excellency the President, the Chairperson of the African Union Commission. You have the floor, sir. Excellence, Monsieur le Président. Excellency Chairperson, Chairman of the African Union, Excellency Heads of State and Government and Heads of Delegation, Mr. Secretary General of the United Nations, Honorable Ministers, Invited Guests of the African Union, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's with great pleasure that I welcome you to this crucible of the African Union where we build year after year the future of Africa. At the same time, I would like to seize this opportunity to sincerely wish you a happy new year for you, your countries, and for our peoples and the continent. Allow me, first of all, to extend my highest appreciation to His Excellency President Abdel Fattah Hassisi, President of the Republic of Egypt, for the sterling work he's been carrying out as chairperson of the African Union. It is an, a privileged opportunity to commend the work we had, I had with His Excellency and his cooperation with us at the service of the coasts of the continent and in order to push for its strategic plans. I'm confident, Mr. President, that we will continue building on your wisdom and your experience and expertise. Thank you very much, Mr. President. 
I wish to congratulate His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa on being elected as Chairman of the Union for the current year 2020. <clears throat> Excellency, I assure you on my full support. As we are in the Mandela Hall, the spirit of Mahadiba is watching over us. I imagine him telling you, Cyril, you are loyal to our struggle for Africa. You know that Africa needs leadership. I look forward to you doing your best. I submit. I would like to seize this opportunity to express my sincere congratulations to the Right Honourable Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Dr. Abiy Ahmed, for his distinction that he won uh, the uh, Nobel Peace uh, Prize. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the year that just ended has not been a year full of peace and harmony in the world. The one that is ushered in does not announce that we have come to the end of all our pains and tribulations. We need the constant mobilization of all our energies in order to take up uh, these challenges. At the eastern part, the region of our continent, on the edges of the Red Sea and uh, the Straits, uh, where a third of the world trade is uh, plying through, and taking into account the seriousness of the tensions and also the proximity with Africa is of concern. The precarity of the world is uh, being glaring at us and uh, we have all suffered in order to preserve humanity from the horrors of war. The case of Palestine, uh, which is the most flagrant uh, example of the fragility of the international situation. The American-Israeli plan, which is called the deal of the century, which has been prepared out of any consultations with and also in the absence of those who are mainly concerned at the Palestinian is the umpteenth uh, violation of the United Nations uh, resolution and that oh, and those of the uh, African Union which is trampling underfoot the rights of the Palestinian people. It is supposed to resolve the problem of uh, the Palestinians. But we have to fear that this will be the contrary, that it has heightened the tension in the region and even beyond. In Africa, the persistence of hotbeds of terrorism in many regions uh, and uh, their development uh, has in fact challenged the conscience of the international community and uh, this cancer has to be eradicated. It is always there and active and which is even uh, threatening the collapse of certain member states and in the depth uh, of the continent and beyond the traditional hotbeds like a uh, hydra-headed uh, uh, monster uh, which threatens the civilians even up to Mozambique and even in the DRC where the main victims of these bar acts of barbarism are women and children. The Horn of Africa, the Sahel, the Lake Chad Basin uh, today are a, a prey to war, where the military and the civilians, uh, in fact, are dying every week, and the children have seen their schools closed down, or they are destroyed, or because they are the children, uh, the, uh, the teachers and the school children have to flee. In fact, uh, this uh, very bloody and uh, blind terrorism, in fact. Uh, and the lack of solidarity is very disconcerting. How can we escape and shirk the question that is that not to take show solidarity with these brotherly countries, to speak bluntly and frankly what is outside the countries that are victim themselves? Rwanda and uh, those of ECOWAS, uh, no other African country 
to the best of our knowledge uh, of the Union, which have the economic, financial, and industrial and logistic and military potentials have not shown or moved a finger of solidarity with these countries and the peoples who are expecting this solidarity. This deficit of active solidarity is one of the fragilities of our systems of resistance and our overall capacity of continental resilience. I strongly wish that this African solidarity be uh, the spearhead of uh, the international uh, support for this Sahel and with our partners in the world. This resilience has been put to test by the different natural disasters, floods in Zimbabwe, in Malawi, in Mozambique, in Madagascar, and not to mention only these, the locust invasion in Kenya and uh, Ethiopia, and obviously in many parts of the African continent. In this moment, how can we not think uh, with compassion of our friends of the People's Republic, uh, Pop, uh, Republic of China, which have been the victims of this coronavirus, uh, and we express our feelings of solidarity with them. Ladies and gentlemen, invited guests, uh, our countries have made significant efforts in order to respond to the various challenges and demands. These efforts have to be maintained and strengthened in order to avoid that our youth could take the perilous path of immigration or to seek refuge in the terrorist doctrines. In fact, each of our state, and I would like to commend here the but in consultation with the uh, Youth uh, Council that was and my uh, special envoy, Aya Shebi, to pay particular attention in the programs of the Union for Youth and also with the initiative of One Million by 2021, an initiative which we launched in April and which will offer to one million youth uh, training in and education, employment and entrepreneurial by 2021. The development of women on the continent, we go to the status and the empowerment of women and gender parity, and yet they are subjected to violence, is one of the source of major concerns of the African Union. This year is an important year for gender equality. And African Union, through my uh, and special environment and minister job, and our effort, uh, member states have made a lot of efforts uh, for uh, women to have access to entrepreneurship, to have access uh, to financial solutions, and the solutions that are being proposed to eradicate uh, violence against women. And I wish to work with the member states in order to declare the decade of 2020-2030 for the financial inclusion of African women. Women ask for more, and I support them in their legitimate ambition. Ladies and gentlemen, a third scourge of the harmonious revolution in our member state that call into question the social balance that is the inter-community conflicts. This resurgence of this communal religion and which shows the weaknesses of our member states uh, and also various uh, factors that are feeding into it. In fact, uh, the traditional economic systems uh, and uh, in so for the protection and the conquest uh, for spaces which are below the demands and the needs of millions of human beings. The objective factor and the manipulation of uh, some elites uh, which uh, are using this for political purpose and using another logic and uh, the terrorists uh, are creating uh, the necessary condition for them to continue to prevail and terrorize our peoples. In fact, uh, the, whether the leaders, the academicians, the researchers, all should interlook this. Uh, in fact, these are only a few exam examples and non-exhaustive, but I just want to add two specific questions which uh, will, uh, in fact, show our responsibilities and to take our responsibilities in the Western Sahara and that of Libya. 
The conflict in the Western Sahara remains the oldest one which has not been resolved on the continent and remains a source of concern for our organization as well as for the peoples. I am determined to pursue my efforts for the effective implementation of the decision of Nwakshot, that is, to ask the Troika to find an effective solution to the efforts made by the United Nations. And uh, the parties have voluntarily, in fact, contributed to a solution to the problem. Now, as regards Libya, Africa has constantly uh, reminded the that uh, there is no military solution to this problem. His preference for a political process uh, which is authentically and genuinely inclusive and ownership by the Libyans of their own national destiny within the framework of their continental organization. I want to welcome the support, uh, the decision of the High Level Committee on Libya for the speedy launching of the Initiative of Peace and Reconciliation in Libya in harmony with the decisions of the Berlin Conference and in conformity with the principles of African solution to African problems far from the external interests uh, which have uh, perilous uh, agendas for Africa. By affirming these principles, we have continued to stress that uh, the role of Africa in the search uh, for solution to the crisis is not exclusive. An active and effective cooperation with all our partner, international partners, particularly the United Nations, is there. Uh, such an orientation cannot be concretized if the continent, only if the continent is united and speak with one voice. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the year that ended uh, has been that of challenges, which I have described very prosaically, but it has also been despite the difficulties of major achievements. In the area of peace and security, we have pursued our efforts uh, of consultation with IGAD for peace building and reconciliation in South Sudan, where the parties have been uh, encouraged, strongly encouraged to speed up the process of pacification and reconciliation in the country. The formation of a government of national unity within the time frame that has been set is an exigency and it is a necessity for restoring peace. In Somalia, AMISOM continues to deploy in a context which is particularly difficult in order to combat terrorism and support the efforts of stabilization and reconstruction undertaken by the government. I want to pay tribute to the troop contributing countries and also for all those who are making sacrifices and the results that we have obtained. In the Central African Republic, our efforts together with the efforts of the government, of ACAS and the United Nations have intensified in order to ensure a rigorous implementation of the Peace and Reconciliation Agreement. I in fact, uh, note uh, with uh, pleasure that uh, there has been a reduction and uh, decline in the violence. Despite the political dialogue in Cameroon, uh, we have uh, the uh, and the Commission is ready to support uh, the process uh, of building peace and reconciliation in that country. In the Sudan, the African mediation has uh, won, uh, scored a resounding success with the establishment of the institution of the Transunion, the Sovereign Council and the civilian government that has been called upon uh, to work together. This experience shows that if Africans in all independence uh, settle down to solve their problems in harmony with their international partners, Africa can make a difference. The new authorities of the Sudan have pledged uh, to pursue these uh, ne uh, negotiations with the armed groups and unreservedly we support them and we call upon the international community to redouble efforts in order to sustain uh, the uh, democratic process in the Sudan. In this spirit, we call upon the United States of America to join uh, these efforts and also to take the Sudan out of the list that sponsor terrorism. Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, under 
institutional reform. 2019 has seen significant progress, and this has uh, touched on the restructuring and the accountability of the Commission, governance and coherence between the different organs, the division of labor between the union and the regional economic communities, the issue of partnerships, as well as the implementation of the new financing system of the union. This search for budgetary independence goes along with uh, administrative and financial uh, uh, reorganization and uh, we have inflicted the sanctions against those uh, staff that have been uh, indulging in irregularities and uh, also dealing with a, a peace fund. This in fact, uh, the uh, agreement on the continental free trade area. It's a historical agreement uh, where we are going to fulfill one of the major dreams of our founding fathers, which is at the very heart of the con uh, integration of the continent. The success of this flagship project, that is, which we want to make uh, this to be the pillar of development of the continent, is most decisive, and yet infrastructures are very decisive. We have an important gap which we need to fill. We have to add the uh, free per, uh, movement of persons and goods and the protocol has been signed by 33 member states and ratified only by four member states. I want to appeal to the member states that have not done so to do it diligently. The real mission of the Secretary General of the AFCTA, uh, CFTA and uh, once it takes up this uh, post, uh, we are going to go ahead with this major achievement on your behalf. I want to express our gratitude to the President of Ghana, His Excellency Nana Akufo Addo, who has graciously offered the headquarters that will host uh, the Secretariat uh, of CFTA. The Africa that we want also goes uh, through uh, the linkages and also the air transport. That is why we have the single air, African single air transport uh, market. Uh, and only 18 countries have decided to implement that uh, agreement. In fact, we have seen a major transformation in institutional reforms. In 2019 and 2020, there will be 40, uh, 40 elections will be organized, or have been organized and will be organized. The organization of peaceful elections is a challenge and also a major issue in our strategy. It is of great importance uh, that we uh, do everything to organize elections within the deadlines as set by the constitutions. It is high time that Africa has to show uh, this institutional modernism. Excellencies, Heads of State and Government 2020 has been proclaimed the, li the year for silencing the guns on the continent. How can we s succeed in this feat where well, we have a continent that is uh, in fact uh, grappling with uh, terrorism, inter-community conflicts, uh, electoral disputes, uh, and by acting concretely on all these issues and their root causes, and by giving the necessary political, military, and diplomatic means, you then we can silence the guns, and that is the only way we can win. Nine, 2020 is the last year of this term and uh, uh, tenure of this commission. We have to redouble efforts in order to make sure that the next commission that will find a better and uh, more uh, commission that will be more conducive to implement the Agenda 2063 for a peaceful, prosperous Africa. I thank you for your kind attention. I thank Mr. Musafaki Mohammed for his statement and his efforts, and I would like now to invite Mr. Ahmed Abu al Secretary General of the League of Arab States. Your Excellency President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, Your Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Your Excellency, 
Mr. Musafaki, allow me first of all to extend my proud to be here with you on responding to the kind invitation of my brother, the chairperson of the AUC, which is, which reflects the excellent cooperation between the African Union and the League of Arab States and our commitment to deepening these uh, tight bonds. And I would like also to extend my thanks and greetings to His Excellency Abdel Fattah Hassisi and commend him for the successful chairing of the African Union and the important achievements that the African Union had made under his leadership, including the establishment of the African continental free trade area and for the ref structural reform of the Union as well as uh, the uh, establishment or the improvement of peace and security in the continent. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, you are meeting today until the theme silencing the guns, creating conducive conditions for the development of Africa which is indeed an issue or a theme that is in line with objectives and principles of the Arab League. We do share the same aspirations and face the same challenges and we believe that we cannot, cannot have overall and sustainable development if we do not lay the foundations for peace and security in our two regions. I'm confident therefore that we can but, and we have, we should uh, deepen and our um, common work and endeavors uh, in order to address uh, the uh, um, political troubles uh, and problems that destabilize our states. We have been uh, working together to back our brothers in Sudan in uh, the political transition processes last April. The, uh, the Arab League has made a number of good offices with the parties concerned and the African Union contributed to the mediation process that which led to the uh, agreeing on the documents to move to civilian <coughs> leadership and we still have a lot of efforts to be made together. And in the spirit of complementarity standing by Sudan and supporting them in settling their problems, including the completion of the peace operation between the government and the armed forces, as well as the reconstruction and the lifting of all the um, uh, sanctions imposed on the mood also call for the enhancement of our cooperation to back Somalia in combating terrorism and in consolidating peace and stability on their lands and in um, uh, implementing and the uh, development the development agenda as well as uh, the uh, constitutional process they are preparing would also would like to continue our complementary uh, efforts in order to back Comoros for the stability and for the economic development and uh, the, and the plans that have uh, been initiated by His Excellency Rosalie Osman. We would need also to deepen cooperation and coordination with you in any endeavor that uh, would lead for lead to peace and stability in our two regions. We stand by you in completing the peace process in South Sudan and also the reconciliation process that are occurring in the Horn and Africa and to, in order to put an end to the security threats and terrorism that destabilize the Sahel region. <coughs> we are witnessing in Libya a, a, a dangerous escalation of the crisis after 10 months of uh, the uh, beginning of the killings around Tripoli and the multiplication of the foreign military interventions, the blatant ones. And you know that the responsible, and I'm aware of the, you are aware of the responsibility of the Arab League in order to address and to find a solution to this conflict and to help our brothers in Libya. <coughs> we also appreciate the position of the African Union and their efforts to find solution to this uh, conflict and dual mediation in the reconciliation process.
in this country. I'm confident that any endeavor, any effort that we'll be making will be coordinated and we will work that we will work in complementarity and we will focus on a number of uh, priorities that we all agree on. That is to uh, establish uh, the um, or to continue the truce, the current truce and to supervise the end of hostilities and also to supervise uh, and to put an end to any foreign interference in Libya and to back them in the economic and social plans that are being agreed have been agreed are on in Berlin and based on the Sukhairat agreement as well as the uh, United Nations agreements. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, the State of Arab Leagues highly appreciates the principal position of the African Union in support of the Palestinian cause and the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people to put an end to the, uh, uh, the Israeli uh, occupation. And I would like here to hail and commend my brother, the chairperson of the African Union Commission, in his position and stand in support of our brothers, especially after the, de the uh, declaration of the uh, latest uh, plan uh, uh, between the Americans and the Israelis. I am confident, I'm sure, that Africa will continue uh, its uh, support to the, uh, the Palestinian the Palestinian people by refusing and rejecting this unfair deal as uh, raised and as expressed by the Arab League and the international community I would like to conclude to insist on enhancing our cooperation and also to uh, and her cooperation as part of the uh, next Africa-Arab summit that will be held in uh, very soon in the Saudi Arabia, inshallah. And I would like here to reiterate our commitment to continue to work with the African Union and its commission as well as its chair for the success of this summit. And let me take this opportunity to uh, congratulate <coughs> His Excellency Selil Ramaphosa for being uh, for his appointment as chairperson of the African Union, and I'm sure that under his wise leadership, we will you will achieve your objectives, and you will focus on your priorities and priorities of your countries and uh, <coughs> your populations. Thank you very much. Ashkur. I thank Mr. Ahmed Abu Ghaid, Secretary General of the League of Arab States, and I would like now to invite Mr. Antonio Manuel Gutierrez, Secretary General of the United Nations, to deliver his statement. Your Excellency Abdel Fattah al Sisi. Your Excellency Musafaki Muhammad, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. I congratulate incoming chairperson President Ramaphosa and I commend President Al Sisi for his service as chairperson over the past year, full of achievements for the African Union. The United Nations strategic partnership with the African Union is of paramount importance for us. Since I took office, I have sought to build stronger ties between our two organizations based on shared values, mutual respect, common interests, and if I may, my own deep personal commitment to Africa's peace, prosperity, and well-being, and my conviction that Africa's challenges can only be solved with African leadership. We see the fruits of those efforts in what we have agreed and achieved together. A far-reaching joint AU-UN framework on peace and security on the continent, I commend the African Union for making silencing the guns such a prominent part of its work by 2020. And the comprehensive plan to make the most of our complementary sustainable development programs, the UN's Global 2030 Agenda and Africa's Agenda 2063. I can guarantee the full support of the United Nations for this landmark initiative. 
Ultimately, silencing the guns is not just about peace and security, but also about inclusive and sustainable development and human rights. Excellencies, today I wish, I wish to highlight three challenges of particular urgency. First, making further inroads against poverty through a critical decade of action to deliver the Sustainable Development Goals. The eradication of poverty remains an essential social and moral obligation for humankind. Second, tackling the climate crisis and third, silencing the guns. On poverty, Agenda 2063 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development have galvanized Africa's governments and their development partners. I commend the African Union for complementing the first report on the country-level implementation of the 10-year implementation plan of Agenda 2063. This is a key milestone on the path to realizing the Africa we want. We can point to significant improvements in living standards, including access to quality education, health care, food security, basic social services and infrastructure. But progress remains slow and uneven when it comes to eradicating poverty and ending exclusion. Africa has long been a victim of a globalization that has not benefited all nations equitably. With agriculture and other subsidies, trade and financial rules, and distorted markets working often to the detriment of the African continent. And that is why I will continue to advocate for a fair globalization that works for all nations and not all, and all people. I have been witnessing the efforts of many governments in Africa to eliminate corruption, reform tax systems, and improve governance and institutions. But the international community must complement these efforts, which must stronger determination in fighting tax evasion, money laundering, and the illicit flows of capital. These have been depriving African countries of essential resources for development. Excellencies, one key to poverty eradication is the promotion of gender equality and the rights and meaningful engagement of women and girls. Again, we have seen advances across Africa, but as it is the case everywhere in the world, much remains to be done. At the bottom line, this is a question of power. We still live in a male-dominated world and these will have to change. That is why I made gender parity a centerpiece of UN reform and gender equality and the advancement of women a top priority in all UN does. <laughs> Peace, social cohesion and sustainable development require women's contribution and leadership. It is our joint responsibility to ensure that women are not excluded from critical decision-making in peace processes and post-conflict governance. And I commend the efforts of the African Women Leadership ne Leaders Network and FemWise Africa in strengthening the role of women in conflict prevention and mediation. Excellencies, it's also necessary to engage and empower Africa's youth. They too have a vital contribution to make as agents of change and, not, and must not be marginalized or excluded. In its 75th anniversary this year, the UN is committed to listen to youth and all sectors to determine how to achieve the sustainable development goals and the future we want. Let us work to provide not only social space to young people, but opportunities for work and incomes. Excellencies, let me turn now to the climate crisis. The past 10 years were the hottest on record and global greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise. Africa is the least responsible for climate disruption, yet it is among the first and worst to suffer. Its nations need assistance to build resilience to adapt to the inevitable impacts to come. Temperature rise in Africa is twice the global average. Last year was devastating along with the destruction of cyclones Idai, Idai and Kenes, there are numerous underreported climate-linked crises from the Sahel to Zambia, from Kenya to Madagascar. A climate-related locust infestation is causing misery across vast swaths of East Africa. And addressing climate-related security risks in the Horn of Africa, Central Africa and the Sahel must be a priority. 
Ultimately, science tells us the solution to the climate crisis is to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees from pre-industrial levels and boost resilience. That means achieving global climate neutrality by 2050. Major emitting countries and industrial sectors that are not yet claiming they will do so have a particular responsibility. If they do not deliver, all our efforts, and in particular all African efforts, will be in vain. We need more ambition and in mitigation, especially for Africa's sake, but also more ambition on adaptation and finance to help Africa build resilience of its countries and communities and allow for effective recovery and reconstruction. And I commend Africans' long-standing moral and political leadership on the climate emergency. COP25 was a disappointment. It is imperative that we work together to make COP26 a success so Africa can receive the support it needs. And there is a clear link between climate change and the unprecedented Luxus crisis plaguing Ethiopia and East Africa. Warmer seas mean more cyclones, generating the perfect breeding ground for locusts. I express my deep solidarity with the people and communities affected. The United Nations has issued an urgent appeal for assistance, and I ask the international community to respond with speed and generosity. Excellencies, en ce qui concerne l'initiative... Your Excellencies, with, with concern in relation to the initiative of Salis in the Guns, 2019 actually marked major successes. Together, we did successfully undertake mediation missions throughout the continent, particularly to support electoral processes. And our joint efforts made it possible for us to pave the way for the agreements to be undertaken. The events in Sudan are quite remarkable. The African Union was at the forefront of the mediation process that led to the, the, the setting up of a uh, civilian transitional government. And the two organizations are working very closely together with other key stakeholders to help the transition government to deliver on its commitment towards the Sudanese people. And I want to seek clear and loudly here that it is time to expunge Sudan from the list of states supporting and funding terrorism and to rather drum up international support that will enable the country overcome its challenges. 2020 is also going to be an auspicious year for South Sudan. The pre-transition period will be coming to an end very, very soon. The leaders of South Sudan has to hear, the, listen to the, the, the voices of the people who are suffering, that they should agree once and for all to restore peace in South Sudan. The Central African Republic is another area that testifies the strategic partnership between our two countries, our two organizations, and we have to preserve this peace process and also to support the free and fair elections slated for this year at the end of this year. Your Excellencies, peacekeeping missions are predicated on solid partnerships with member states and the African Union. Stronger relationship between the United Nations and the African Union is an absolute priority for us. We should never forget that not only most of the peacekeeping operations of the United Nations are in Africa, but that also most of the Blue Helmets are themselves Africans. And since I launched the peacekeeping action some two years ago, the Secretariat and the Member States have made considerable progress in order to make peacekeeping missions more efficient. But peacekeeping missions in their current form are not enough, but especially where there is no peace to be kept, as we can see in the Sahel region. We need more and more, we need peace enforcement missions and combating terrorism led by, um, the United, led by the African Union and supported by the United Nations. The experience of the G5 
Sahel and Somalia have shown that these operations could be more efficient. And for them to be efficient, they have to be mandated by the United Nations within the in Chapter 7 of the Charter, and we should also have assessed contributions to fund these operations. It is obvious this fund funding is necessary for the G5 Sahel, but also we need sufficient funding to overcome terrorism in Africa. Unfortunately, the international community is not supporting the efforts of Africa. We have an entire region that has been weakened by terrorism. Thousands of people have lost their lives and others are con continue to suffer in Burkina Faso, in Mali, in Niger. The growing complexity of terrorism targeting civilians and military people requires a more robust and integrated action based particularly along the uh, frontiers. And we need to help the Sahel countries to restore the presence of the state everywhere. We also have to overcome economic despair and exclusiveness in these countries. And we have to continue to build or to create um, favorable conditions so that the people of these countries can actually live in peace. We also need to put an end to the conflict in Libya. We should not forget that the crisis in Libya, just like the climate crisis, has a direct effect on the Sahel and beyond. Libya wouldn't have found itself in a more serious, in the serious conflict without the direct complicity of some members of the international community. The resolutions of the uh, United Nations are Trampled, are trampled up upon even before the ink goes dry. This is unacceptable. And I know just how frustrated the African Union is in the situation concerning the, the situation in Libya since 2011. And I share your sentiments. Yesterday, together, we put in place a new partnership framework between the African Union and the United Nations to better coordinate our common efforts. And the meeting of the high-level committee of the African Union on Libya, which recently took place in Brazzaville, is a positive step in the right direction. And I fully support the idea of organizing a meeting to reconcile the two warring factions in Libya here in Africa. I will continue to insist on the fact that only a political solution by and for Libyans will provide peace in Libya and that any international or foreign intervention is only going to stoke the embers of the conflict. And so an immediate ceasefire is absolutely necessary. Your Excellencies, the challenges that we face are complex, are many, and are varied, but they are also shared challenges. Our response to these challenges has to be collective and coordinated. And I want to reaffirm my support to continue to collaborate closely with the African Union and African countries so that together we can truly reach the Africa we want as enshrined in Agenda 2063 and that truly and effectively we're going to silence the guns for good. I thank you. Ashkur. I thank Mr. Antonio Gutierrez, the United Nations Secretary General, and I would like now to invite Mr. Mohamed Shidi, Prime Minister of Palestine, to make his statement. Your Excellency, President Abdel Fattah Hassisi, Your Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Right Honorable Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Your Excellency, Musa Faki Mohammed, President Chairperson of the African Union Commission, Your Excellency, UN Secretary General, Mr. Gutierrez, my brother and friend, Secretary General of the Arab League. It's a great 
honor and an important occasion and opportunity for Palestinian people to continue taking part to the African summit, not only for the importance of such a summit for the African continent, but also because there is a long history linked of Palestine linked to Africa, and many bonds that link entire Africa with Palestine. I would like to convey to you the greetings of His Excellency Mahmoud Abbas, the President of Pal State of Palestine, wishing you full success in achieving your objective and thanking you and thanking Africa for their uh, long-standing support. I would like also to greet Egypt and His Excellency Abdel Fattah Hassisi and commend him for the achievements he made while he was chairing the African Union and wishing to sisterly South Africa full success in leading the African Union. I would like to congratulate uh, the Right uh, Honorable Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed for receiving the uh, Peace uh, Nobel Prize. This uh, shows the important role played by Ethiopia in preserving pe international peace and, st and uh, stability. Your Excellencies, the relation between Africa and Palestine is very important in the march of our peoples for a brighter future in belief of the values of liberty and justice in a multilateral world that give to all uh, the peoples of the world their opportunities and their place to uh, self-determine, to determine their own future and to contribute to the international affairs. Uh, Palestine is uh, proud of uh, the support by the African Union to the cause of uh, Palestine, but al and also the, the role played in improving the African-Arab relations. Your summit this year has an extremely important theme that is silencing the gun and creating the conducive conditions for the development of Africa. This theme goes beyond uh, the African continent and reaches especially uh, Palestine that is endeavoring to silence the, silence the guns of uh, the Israeli occupation and would like to uh, s contribute in the success of your theme. Palestine uh, takes advantage of uh, the ads and assistance of many countries in the world, including Africa, and is cooperated in many sectors in agriculture, health, education, and also sharing expertise and experience in security affairs and the participation in combating terrorism. Dear sisters, dear brothers, the African countries uh, has always stood by the two-state solution with and return to the 1967 uh, borders and has uh, always reiterated the right of Palestinians to their uh, uh, city, capital city, is Jerusalem. The plan initiated by Trump in the 25th of January has no international baseline whatsoever and, and turn a deaf ear to any international legitimacy. This has not been coordinated with us, but Israel has participated to its crafting. This uh, plan <coughs> establishes and deepens the occup occupation and deprives us from enjoying and benefiting from our natural resources and it gives the possibility for Israel to have more Israeli uh, Palestinian lands but what the benefits for Palestinians will take longer time ladies and gentlemen what is submitted to us in this plan is not does not constitute a minimum of justice and rights for our people therefore the Arab states and Islamic states have rejected this plan. It has also been rejected by Russia, Africa, African Union, the European Union, China, and Canada. And the, the U.S. Has, has not found any uh, one single ally to this plan. 
in this time we have always uh, been committed to political a political solution based uh, on international legitimacy and legality but this uh, american plan will give the entire jerusalem to uh, to uh, to israel and encourages uh, settlements and gives more settlements uh, illegally and irregularly on our lands. And then the Palestinian state will be torn apart and their people and the Palestinian people will live in Bantustans within a, a regime of apartheid that you struggled against and you deprive the Palestinian people to return to their land. The Trumps plan would like to legitimize uh, the fait accompli and would like to, to um, make the entire world recognize this, this uh, status, this uh, fait accompli, which is indeed only uh, the occupation, an illegal and legitimate occupation. This uh, plan doesn't uh, give any consideration to the sovereignty of Palestinians over the land or the, the air, the roads and the in and their waters. It doesn't include any sovereignty in the movement of people, in the movement of uh, commodities and uh, uh, with under this plan the occupation will continue and uh, the uh, status quo will continue and any as usual ladies and gentlemen silence in the guns and combating terrorism and achieving development require the implementation of international law and giving the people self determination democracy and liberty and we uh, really count on uh, your continuous uh, support to the right of people for liberty and independence including the palestinian people the protection of international stability requires the pooling of the international efforts in climbing the issues related to climate counterterrorism and uh, the, uh, we can we will continue uh, working with you within the United Nations and in other fora to settle and address these issues. I would like also to express our consideration where about your uh, for your support while uh, Palestine was chairing Ch the group of 77 and China. This has established the historical uh, relation between us, Mr. President. Uh, Putting an end to the occupation of Palestine will require international endeavors and efforts. And this can be done in an international peace conference that will can be sponsored by the UN. Because the experience of negotiations are they are, ta are, they are taking place current <coughs> currently as are sponsored by the US have failed <coughs> and we need to review these negotiating old mechanisms that date back to 29 years. This is why we re highly appreciate your, reject your rejection and refusal to this uh, American plan and uh, your support uh, to the sovereignty of Palestine. We would like to call upon your continuous support to have a, a peace conference in Palestine. We also call upon you to strengthen and enhance our cooperation in development and in the field of security. Palestine as well counts on the outcomes of the Arab African summit that will be held in Saudi Arabia in March. <coughs> this will give a fresh impetus to our common endeavors to address our common challenges. Our minds and hearts are open for genuine and serious peace in which Palestine will be a partner in negotiations and not be dictated be dictated the principle by reminding all of us that Palestine is the Holy Land Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem and Bethlehem is a Palestinian city and Prophet Muhammad was ascended to the sky from the city of Jerusalem 
the city, the holy city of Jerusalem. And that is where the Palestinians, Christians and Muslims, they live together for peace and justice. And we have learned from Prophet Muhammad that we should reconcile and live together. And we learned from Prophet Jesus that it is not with bread ones live only. Palestinians are not looking for additional loaf of bread. Palestinians are looking for dignity, for freedom, for an independent Palestinian state. Thank you very much. I thank His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Shitia, Prime Minister of the State of Palestine, for his statement. I would like to reiterate that the, Af the Palestinian cause will uh, always be present in the heart and minds of the peoples of Africa who will continue supporting and showing solidarity to the Palestinian people. And now, allow me to share with you some observations, some opening remarks, both at the opening of our summit. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahman. Your Excellencies, Majesties, Head Kings and Heads of State and Government of Africa, Mr. Antonio Gutierrez, UN Secretary General, Mr. Musafaki Mohammed, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, Mr. Ahmed Abulhid, Secretary General of the League of Arab States, Dr. Mohammed Ishitir, Prime Minister of the State of Palestine, Sister Lip State of Palestine, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to reiterate my congratulations to the Right Honorable Prime Minister B. Ahmed for the Peace Nobel Prize, and I would like that we greet him all. On the outset, I would like to express my appreciation and consideration to our African people whom we owe uh, the confidence they placed uh, on us in order for us to turn their expectations to a reality, a deserved reality that we lead to a brighter future. This responsibility that we all shoulder as leaders and this confidence and this mission that sh sh we should carry faithfully and sincerely. Egypt has been honored to chair the African Union for one year. And during that year, many have been done. The close cooperation among us has positive impact on the chairing, the, on the work of Egypt as a chair of the organization in favor of achieving our ambitions, be it in the international arena or in terms of the, the common African and re regional and continental endeavors. I would like to tell you that this period, while Egypt has chaired, chaired our organization, many activities have uh, been undertaken in Egypt that then had shouldered its responsibilities by voicing the position of our union in all faith, be it in inter regional or international fora. And we also had a sense uh, uh, then of the scope of challenges faced we, the, our continent is faced with, but also the promising opportunities that our continent has. I would like to share with you in this respect a summary of the Egyptian experience through a number of priorities for our continent and which are an interdependent and which and I will shed light on some efforts that have been made during 
our chairmanship. First of all, despite the challenges, especially the growing conflicts, especially in the Sahel and extremism and terrorism in the Horn of Africa, we have endeavored to reach peace and stability in Africa and based on the principle of these African solutions to African problems, as this is the best principle to address our problems since we are fully aware of the specificities and peculiarities of our African countries. This is not a theory. This is a reality that has been implemented by Egypt through a number of initiatives, especially through hosting two consultative summits on Libya and Sudan. We also did so last year for Central Africa, DRC, South Sudan, and Guinea-Bissau. While we highly appreciate uh, the co partnership and corporate partnership relations that we have between the African Union and all the other countries and organizations in the world, we are aware of uh, the aware of the importance of our sovereignty and for preserving the achievements of our countries and peoples. And based on an overall vision of uh, uh, achieving peace and security, we are uh, we focused on the importance of the link between security and uh, development. And here again, I would like to uh, share to uh, refer to the establishment in Egypt of the center or the hosting by Egypt of the center, the post-conflict reconstruction and development center. Uh, we have also been tackling the issue of silence in the guns and for the return of, of refugees and internally displaced persons. All these issues and these topics were on the agenda of the Aswan Forum that was hosted by Egypt last December, in which many African leaders have taken part, in which they participated. And this was in favor of establishing and materializing the principle of African solutions to African problems. Two. The establishment and the operationalization of the AFCFTA, as well as uh, its entry into force in uh, the coordination uh, summit in Yemen, it will expedite the trade between Africa among African countries, and this will create new windows of opportunities that are extremely important. That this will lead to the African. Continental integration, especially with the continuation of the serious endeavors and the dialogue that had started last year. In the same vein, and while we were aware of the importance of a consolidating partnership between the, uh, uh, the African Union and the regional economic co communities of the member states in order to complete the, inter the uh, continental integration, the, coordinate, the first coordination summit between the African Union and the regional economic communities in, held in Niamey last July has held the uh, robust foundations to this respect, to this end, and will continue developing these uh, uh, plans. For us, achieving the integration of the continent cannot be efficient if we do not promote the infrastructure of Africa. Linking the different regions of the country is unavoidable. We, in order for us to reach in regional integration, we need to make sure that free movement of people and of, of, of commodities and services uh, be facilitated. Egypt has always uh, reiterated its readiness to work with all the partners in order for us to improve our infrastructure. The uh, African and Egyptian efforts has been crowned 
by the second plan of action to modernize the infrastructure 2021-2030 that we need to support and back. I'm referring to the main uh, plan on the power or energy interconnection between African among African countries and the Cape Town, Cairo line and other major projects to interconnect the railways. And this will contribute to achieve our common objectives. Four, to increase the investment in Africa, rely and count on the empowerment on, of women and the youth of Africa and providing them with the tools of modern technologies and science. Since they are the most important demographic elements in our continent, they are the half of our present and all our future. Hence, the involvement of uh, the women women of youth in Africa in uh, our in peace and security in our countries are also very important and this will guarantee a better future to our continent this year there have been many African uh, continental initiatives in this respect including the uh, launching of uh, the uh, empowerment of one th 100 uh, 1 million uh, youth these recent years, there have been a number of efforts and endeavors by the African Union in order to modernize and to uh, streamline the structures of the African Union through a structural, an entire structural reform. And we hope that these outcomes of this reform will help us achieve our objectives and rationalize the financial resources of our organization and also to establish the principle of taking the African countries taking ownership of their own organization. Many steps have been made in towards the, the reform and concrete results have been reached, especially the in relation to the administrative and structural uh, supervision as well as uh, the uh, Peace fund operationalization and our endeavors and efforts will continue. And this present summit, in its final communique, will look uh, report will um, look uh, into the uh, reforms, the development in the reforms. Ladies and gentlemen, Egypt is proud of having represented Africa. We have been always been concerned with the future and the fate of our peoples have taken part to a number of international meetings in the UN and G77 and China as well as other meetings where I have been proud to represent Africa including with China, Russia and Britain. I have voiced the concerns of African peoples and their aspirations to reach sustainable development, to have job opportunities, speaking for the continent on the importance of putting Africa on the international investment map, making sure that the people, the African people in benefit from the natural natural resources. And tell, I would like to tell you very frankly that all these efforts in all that those his efforts could not be successful without the fruitful cooperation with all of you and without your precious confidence and your assistance. Hence, I would like to extend my great thanks and gratitude to all countries and the chairperson of the African Union Commission, as well as the members of the Commission and the institutions and organs of the African Union, who have spared no efforts to, uh, as to support the initiatives taken. I would like also to extend my congratulations to my brother, President Ramaphosa, President of the Republic of South Africa, who will take the helm of the African Union from today. And I would like to reiterate my unlimited 
confidence in his wise and efficient leadership. And I would like also to reiterate to my brother, President Ramaphosa, my continuous support to his endeavors in order to build on the achievements already made. And I would like to tell you that the efforts made by the Egyptian leadership is has un will not end here. Egypt will continue to support the African positions and support the African actions and continue, Egypt will continue its cooperation, coordination with all the organs of the African Union in order to follow up on the initiatives that have been take, taken under my leadership. With the dear children of my of our dear continent, the Africa that we want 2063 is a principle that is for you, the youth of Africa. You need to continue the path with serious work, relying on our own national capacities and capabilities, and welcoming at the same time any international assistance on the basis of mutual respect and common interests. I'm not going to tell you not to uh, care for difficulties, but I'm going to invite you to face them and address them, to be wise and to be perseverant in your work. I'm confident that we are able together to change the reality to a better one and to have a, br a brighter future that our con a continent deserve among the con countries and the continents of the world. And in relation to what we said during the closed session regarding having a specialized, uh, an extraordinary summit on uh, counterterrorism, I would like to uh, uh, reiterate the uh, readiness of Egypt to host this conference because of the importance of achieving peace and security in our continent. I would like to call for more consultations in preparation for this summit. And this cooperation and the Peace and Security Council is invited to submit to the summit the, any, the details of this summit. I thank you very much for listening. Assalamu alaikum. والآن أدعو رئيس وفد جيبوتي بصفته عميد السلك الدبلوماسي الإفريقي بأديس أبابا للإعلان عن تشكيل هيئة مكتب قمة الاتحاد الإفريقي للعام 2020 وكذلك الإعلان عن رئاسة الاتحاد الإفريقي للعام 2021 وسيقوم فليتفضل The Republic of Djibouti, as the overall dean of the African group, is uh, happy to announce the composition of the Bureau of the 33rd Ordinary Session of the Assembly of Heads of State and Government of the African Union for the year 2020. The southern, for the southern region, South Africa is the chair, Central Africa, the DRC, first vice president, first vice chair. West Africa, second vice chair, Mali, East Africa, Kenya, third vice chairperson. North Africa, the Republic of Egypt, rapporteur. And lastly, it is also my honor to announce to you that the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo is going to be the chair of the union for 20, 2021. Okay. 
Thank you very much and congratulations. I thank His Excellency, Mr. Omar Jila, the President of Djibouti, and I would like to extend my congratulations to the members of the Bureau of the African Union, the Assembly of the African Union for 2020, and the, the chairmanship of my brother, Cyril Ramaphosa, President of South Africa, and my brother, Felix Tiskiri, President of the DRC, on his election as the uh, chairperson of the African Union by 20, in 2021. Wish them full success. I'm honored now to hand over the chair of the African Union to the newly elected chair, Mr. Siri Ramaphosa, President of the Republic of South Africa. And I would like to ask the protocol to accompany him to the high table. <coughs> I take this opportunity to thank President Abdel al-Sisi, the outgone chair of uh, the AU, and I guess my first task is to call upon Cyril Ramaphosa <laughs> to deliver his acceptance speech. <laughs> Your Excellency President Abdel al-Sisi, the outgone Chair of the African Union, Your Excellency's Heads of State and Government, Your Excellency Musafaki Mohammed, Chairperson of the African Commission, Your Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Honorable Mohammed Shetea, 
Prime Minister of the State of Palestine, representing President Abbas, Your Excellencies, former heads of state and government, heads of the AU organs, heads of regional economic communities, commissioners, and the AU Commission, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, and fellow Africans. I stand before you immensely humbled by this great honor that has been bestowed on South Africa to chair this august body that represents the unity of the people of Africa. On behalf of the men and women of South Africa, I graciously accept your collective decision that I should chair the African Union in 2020. In executing this weighty responsibility, I will rely on your continued support, your wisdom and cooperation. I will especially rely on the help, the wisdom and support of the newly elected members of the Bureau. I want to thank our host, Nobel Peace Laureate Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, the government and the people of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia for the excellent hospitality extended to me and my delegation since our arrival here in Addis Ababa. I also want to thank my brother, President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, for the outstanding and commendable manner in which he presided over the work of the African Union during his term of office. We say thank you and thank you, thank you for all the work. As South Africa, we first chaired the African Union following the historic relaunch in South Africa in 2002, when President Thabo Mbeki, who is here with us today, became the chair of the AU. We are deeply humbled by the confidence you have invested in us once again. Your Excellencies, we are mindful of the weighty mission that we have at hand, but we are also mindful of the weight of history here in Ethiopia, a place with such deep and profound connections to Africa's ancient past. Up in the highlands of the north of Ethiopia, in the first century, our ancestors tamed the harsh terrain and established agriculture, herded livestock, minted their own coinage, created their own alphabetical script, built towering monuments, that stand even to this day, and also forged expansive trade routes across the region. In the passage of time, and in the context of time, our forebears understood that true progress and development could be advanced through trade and working together. Today, we stand on the cusp of the greatest step towards continental unity since the founding of the Organization of African Unity. The Africa Continental Free Trade Area that we adopted last year will enable us to work together through intra-Africa trade as it will reignite industrialization and pave the way for Africa's integration into the global economy as a player of considerable weight and scale. It is the realization of the dream of our forebears to see the rich resources of our continent being marshaled for the collective benefit of all Africans. Indeed, we are a continent that is rich. Africa is rich in natural resources, yes, 
but also in history, in intellectual output, in culture, in a sense of humanity, and in human capital. As Africans living in this new era, we shoulder the greatest of all responsibilities to ensure that our wealth as a continent does not become our poverty, that our blessing does not become our curse, and that our endowment does not become our downfall. It is to us that the task has fallen to build an Africa that is prosperous and at peace with itself, an Africa that is capable of achieving the aspirations that this august body set out in Agenda 2063, an Africa connected through a vast network of roads and railways enabling the free movement of goods, people, and services. An Africa whose vast tracts of land support agriculture, commerce, and livelihoods. An Africa whose rivers are harnessed to create power and electricity, electrify villages, towns, cities, homes, and businesses. As incoming chair of the AU, we have set ourselves key priorities to enhance the progress that is already underway during the African decade of action. We would like to deepen our work together in ensuring that the unity of our continent is solid and is based on the founding principles that our forebears crafted and advancing the economic growth and sustainable development that our continent needs. Our collective work to ensure political and economic unity, good governance, and peace should be strengthened by supporting integration, industrialization, economic development, trade, and investment. And in pursuit of this priority, we will host the 13th Extraordinary Summit on the AFCTA to be held back to back with the Extraordinary Summit on Silencing the Guns in May 2020. And I will talk about the silencing of the guns in a little while. Working closely with President Mohamedou Isufu of Niger, in his capacity as the AU champion on the AFCTA, we will work for the finalization of the outstanding issues with regard to this agreement. We must all ensure that the AFCTA does not become a conduit for products with minimal African value addition to enter and penetrate our local markets under the guise of continental integration. There must, be a there must be a reasonable standard set for what constitutes a product that is proudly make, made in Africa. We have to level the playing field for African businesses so that they are able to operate in a large-scale market unfettered by regulatory fragmentation. This is an integral part of rebalancing global trade relations. The era of colonialism and imperialism under which Africa is a pit stop in the global assembly line has passed. The success of the AFCTA depends on infrastructure development. We must all drive the implementation of the Presidential Infrastructure Champion Initiative so that priority and high impact projects act as catalysts for the implementation of the AFCTA. Beyond trade integration, 
We have trained our sides on supporting green growth on the continent and on ensuring that the continent takes advantage of the opportunities that are presented by the green transition. This includes new industries in energy, materials engineering, the circular economy, sustainable agriculture, and clean production. The fourth industrial revolution presents our continent with great opportunities. The uptake of digital technologies will lead to improved competitiveness and provides fresh opportunities for inclusive growth. Millions of our continent's young citizens are digital natives, and we must drive a skills revolution to enable Africa to take a quantum leap into the economy of the future. To give full effect to our attention to this important area of work, we should establish an Africa Artificial Intelligence Forum to also include those who are in the diaspora. Your Excellencies, in this year that we conclude the Decade of African Women, we must advance women's economic and financial inclusion. But we must also address the scourge of gender-based violence that is so rife on our continent. We want to focus on ensuring that there is accountability to global gender commitments. We have heard the calls of the women and the girls of Africa for liberation from the shackles of patriarchy, violence, and economic exclusion. We recall the words of the Egyptian novelist and activist Nawal El Sadawi that women are half the society. You cannot have a revolution without women. You cannot have democracy without women. We intend to work closely with President Akufo Addo of Ghana to ensure the interests of women are mainstreamed and want the years 2020 to 2030 to be declared as the decade of African women's financial and economic inclusion. I believe that the work of the Pan-African Women's Organization, PAU, an organization that was founded in 1962, a year before the founding of the OAU, to promote human rights and gender equality should be recognized and should be strengthened and be resourced so that it can play its rightful role. We have to find more practical and sustainable ways of empowering the women of our continent so that we move beyond the cliches and the general statements that we pronounce on podiums every time. Public and private procurements offer great opportunities as they account for 30% of the GDP of many countries on our continent. Agenda 2063 calls for the allocation of at least 25% of public procurement to be for women-owned businesses, yet women-owned businesses are given less than 1% of procurement. We need to change this. It is not unreasonable. It is not unreasonable to advocate for preferential public procurement legislation to advantage women-owned businesses and for the establishment of preferential trade and customs regimes for women. It can be done and we must do it so that we empower the women of our continent. The rep 
the representation of women in decision-making structures in government, parliaments and other sectors is far too low on our continent. The women of our continent want and demand to occupy their rightful place in all decision-making structures. They deserve at the very least 50% representation on all structures. Those amongst us who have enabled the participation of more women in decision-making structures can testify that they have benefited immensely from the inherent wisdom, insights, and capability and energy of the women who participate in those structures. The women of our continent want to play a meaningful role in developing our continent. Let us not hold them back. We will support the good governance and democracy agenda, leveraging the excellent work of the APRM that we have been asked to chair. We now have 40 members, states, that have joined the APRM. We will engage those member states that have not yet ratified to do so with a view to achieving universal accession by 2030. We will make a contribution to promote peace and security in our collective effort to silence the guns. Through the AU Peace and Security Council, the AU Commission and the collective membership, we will focus our efforts on conflict resolution across the African continent, especially those experiencing protracted conflicts. We will work with President Denis Sassungwesu in his capacity as the chairperson of the AU High Level Committee on Libya to convene an intra-Libyan conference to promote ceasefire and dialogue. We will continue to work with the parties in South Sudan with a view to implementing the outstanding issues of the revitalized agreement in order to pave the way for the formation of the government of national unity. South Africa will also host the Extraordinary Summit on Silencing the Guns in May 2020 to look at the implementation of the AU Master Road Plan Map and at the same time respond to emerging circumstances on the African peace and security landscape. The summit that we will hold must come up with the real actions that we as Africans must take to end conflicts and deal with acts of terrorism that are raging in many countries and regions such as the Sahel, the Horn of Africa, and now spreading to other parts of Southern Africa as well. We must also deal with the actions of other countries outside of our own continent that are fighting proxy wars and fueling ongoing conflicts on our continent. The principle of finding African solutions for African problems must be our overriding theme in addressing all the conflicts on our continent as we work within the frameworks of the AU and the UN. During our chairship, we will champion positioning our continent as a strong and resilient global player. It is therefore an imperative of the time that as Africa, we continue to assert the primacy of multilateralism in world affairs. We must continue to advance this through bolstering the AU's relationship with the UN. Our collective fortunes rely on international cooperation and in ensuring that we live no one behind. That is why the African Union should continue with its support for the struggles of people elsewhere in the world that still suffer under the yoke of oppression. Today we reaffirm our unwavering support and solidarity with the Palestinian people in their legitimate quest for an independent and sovereign state. 
we also reaffirm our unwavering support for the independent and sovereign state as well as the right of the people of Western Sahara to self-determination. I'd like to say with regards to the U.S.-inspired plan for the Palestinians that as I listened to it and as I read everything that's written about it, it brought to mind a horrible history that we as South Africa have gone through. That the apartheid regime once imposed a Bantustan system on the people of South Africa without consultation with them and with the, all the oppressive elements that that plan had. As I listened to the Arab League and as I listened to our colleagues from Palestine, it sounds like this plan, one, has not been consulted with all the people that matter, especially the Palestinians, and it sounds like a Bantustan type of construct. We must ensure that our independence and freedom as the peoples of this continent should be universal. As the internationally acclaimed musician Jonas Gwangwa sang, freedom for some is freedom for none. Our international cooperation must extend to the continental effort to address also the climate uh, crisis. As chair of our work on the climate change, South Africa will prioritize all three global goals in the Paris Agreement, namely mitigation, adaptation, and support. Our union, as I conclude, stands as a testament to the power of political unity. Let us now resume the onward march towards economic integration, development, progress, growth, and shared prosperity. Our continent is definitely on the ascent. It is indeed a regeneration as described by the South African revolutionary Pixlik Isaac Aseme. Let us build the Africa that we want. Let the guns be silenced. Let our swords be beaten to plowshares and our spears turned into pruning hooks. It is the actions that we take from this day onwards that will determine our continent's destiny. If we pursue our objectives with diligence and determination and mobilize all our people to support them, I'm certain that ours will be a meaningful and effective and impactful union. In the words of the great son of the African soil, Ngugi Wa Tiongo, today is tomorrow's treasure. Tomorrow is the harvest of what we plant today. Fellow African leaders, we salute you. Through your leadership, you have sown the seeds for meaningful African unity. Let us now look eagerly to the harvest. We will, with all the actions we take to consolidate the unity of our continent, to foster the economic integration of our continent, to empower the women of our continent, and to silence the guns. Our people await the harvest of our work. As glorious is our past, so too will be our future. I thank you. Now we have a few more speakers, three.
heads of state who have been newly elected and we would like to invite them to make their remarks. There are four. There are four. But due to time constraints, we request them to speak from their seats. We want to request the President of the People's Democratic Republic of Algeria to take the microphone and address us for the time allocated to him. <clears throat> Mr. President, Your Majesties, Excellencies, it is a delightful opportunity I have here to address you very warmly, my dear fellow heads of state and government and member states of our continent, I would like to particularly thank my brother Abdel Fattah Sisi, President of the Arab Republic of Egypt, for his stewardship and the efforts he's been making while chairing the African Union. Let me take this opportunity as well to extend my most heartfelt congratulations to my brother Cyril Ramaphosa, President of the Republic of South Africa, on his election as Chairperson of the African Union for this year. I'm confident, I'm fully confident that the African Union and uh, the leadership of South Africa will gain a fresh impetus in the African common endeavors in order to improve and deepen solidarity and unity among the African people based on the lofty principles that have been led, set by our, the founding fathers of our organization in order and in order to revitalize the role of the African Union at the international arena. It is fair to say that the African Union has made a very positive steps, steps so far. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, like Many countries, Algeria has witnessed since its independence some hard times. And today, and thanks to the confidence and the potential of our people and our youth, Algeria is opening a new page towards enhancing democracy and creating conducive condition, conditions for its prosperity. The new Algeria that is being built will continue to be faithful to its principles and its commitments and will from now on fully play, play its role in Africa and in the world. Algeria that has chosen to change its regime and to build a state where prevails the rule of law and democracy after the elections that have taken that took place in last December and that enabled the Algerian people to establish its popular or people's sovereignty in all transparency is now moving forward in the path of economic, political, and social reforms. This will lead to the expected changes and to the construction of a new, strong, secure, prosperous Algeria based on the rule of law, on transparency, 
and on the enhanced consolidation of individual liberties. An Algeria that will more efficiently contribute to the development of the African continent. Our successful experience heartens us in the fact that settling the, the conflicts of, in our country should be based on national reconciliation and dialogue without any foreign interference. Based on this conviction, on this confidence, Algeria will always contribute and relentlessly contribute to in consolidating the endeavors in favor of peace and security in Africa and will continue its support to the initiatives aiming at putting an end to conflicts and will continue to defend and champion the legitimate causes of the peoples, peoples that have the right to uh, practice self-determination. As for the Palestinian cause, the independent state with the borders of 67 with the capital city of Jerusalem should and must be built. Our world is facing unprecedented challenges. And the crisis in the Sahel is a deplorable example of this reality. The stability in countries such as Mali has surprisingly been uh, affected. In, in addition to Niger, which is not, which has not been protected from attack, terrorist attacks, with the escalation of. Uh, bloody attacks perpetrated by terrorists in Burkina Faso and some attempts in the Sahel countries. The instability is prevailing in the Sahel despite the efforts and the courageous initiatives taken by the concerned countries in the Chad Basin. The, the countries of the region also are facing very courageously the attacks by Boko Haram through the uh, common and multiple forces. And I would like here to reiterate our solid the solidarity of Algeria with these sisterly countries. And I would like here again to say once again that we are fully determined to push for peace or to support peace and national reconciliation in Mali based on the Algiers Agreement. As for Libya, sisterly Libya, with which we share common fate and 1,000 kilometers of borders, the situation there is a real source of concerns for us. The brotherly people of Libya does, do not deserve the sufferings and hardships they are experiencing today. This is why Algeria has offered to host uh, the dialogue between the, Afri the Libyan brothers based uh, on our principles and based on the agreement of uh, Berlin and in Brazzaville recently during the uh, meeting of the high-level African Union Committee on Libya and uh, the privileged leadership of my brother, Denis Sassoon Ngesu. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, this is the deplorable situation prevailing in our on our eastern and southern brothers. As for the western borders uh, of, for Algeria, the Sahrawi coast has not yet known any development. For, for many years, the UN and the UN Security Council has been supporting, have been, sorry, supporting our continental organization in implementing the peace process based on the principle of self-determination of the Sahrawi people. Mr. President, I would like also to commend the important steps made by our continent 
in favor or towards the continental integration, especially with the entry into force of the African continental free trade area and the, and the implementation of the concrete projects in, or in order to consolidate infrastructure that is under Auda Nepad. Algeria will always be ready to contribute to the consolidation of our integration and our efforts to resolve our problems with our own means. In order to take our destiny into our hands and to control our development processes and the importance lent by Algeria to some structural projects such as the Sahara Highway and the gas pipeline linking Algeria to Nigeria are an examples of Algeria's in Algeria's interest to our integration. Algeria cannot ignore our the neighboring countries or the continent African that is our continent. And if we have been more or less absent some in these recent years, because we were busy with our internal affairs, we do admit today, but we we rather are determined today to continue our support and our close work with the African Union institutions. And I decided to give a fresh impetus to the Algerian African cooperation and this political will will be materialized or will be concretized through concrete initiatives. I decided to create an Algerian agency for international cooperation in, fa in favor of solidarity and development with, of course, an, an African dimension and the purpose of this center is uh, to enhance the solidarity and assistance with our neighboring countries in Africa, especially the Sahel countries. Your Majesties, Your Excellencies, we will be celebrating in two days uh, the uh, anniversary of our leader, Mandela, getting out of prison. Let me quote him. Mandela said, we will be working together in order to encourage dialogue wherever there is conflict and to rekindle hope wherever there is despair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, President. We now ask the President of the Republic of Botswana to address us as well. Your Excellency, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, President of the Republic of South Africa and Chairperson of the African Union. Your Excellency, Mr. Abdel Fattah El Sisi, President of the Arab Republic of Egypt and immediate past Chairperson of the African Union. My dear colleagues, Heads of State and Government here present. Your Excellency, Mr. Musa Faki Mahmat, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me start by expressing my profound appreciation for the warm reception extended to me on my first participation at this summit as the democratically elected president 
of the Republic of Botswana. As many of you are certainly aware, I've been a regular at the African Union summits for quite some time now, but as Vice President of the Republic of Botswana. Botswana went to the polls on the 23rd of October 2019, at which my political party, the Botswana Democratic Party, emerged victorious. As such, I was sworn in as President of the Republic of Botswana on the 1st November 2019. I therefore wish to, once again, profoundly thank Your Excellencies for the congratulatory messages you sent to me following my ascension to the Presidency of the Republic of Botswana. Mr. Chairman, let me take this opportunity to convey my sincere congratulations to you on your assumption of the Chair of our Union. You can count on my full support and that of my government during your tenure of office. Since this is my maiden statement to this Assembly as the President of Botswana, I wish to pledge my personal commitment and that of my government to continue working closely with the African Union, together with the other leaders, towards achievement of Africa's aspirations and developmental agenda. Mr. Chairman, the challenges currently afflicting Africa are complex and varied. As such, they dictate that we should continue to put our heads together as leaders to find solutions to these challenges if we are to realize the Africa we want. The collective resolve of our continental body and indeed our various regional economic communities towards the attainment of our Agenda 2063 should be our eternal inspiration in our pursuit to deliver a lasting legacy. It is indisputable that this can be the thread that repairs the effects of colonialism, underdevelopment, and the agony being experienced by our peoples. Mr. Chairman, it is critical that we sustain our abiding faith in our continental organization, as it has the potential to tackle the myriad of challenges that continue to slow down our development efforts and destabilize our communities. Consequently, we are singularly and collectively compelled to work towards finding lasting solutions to the protected conflicts ravaging some parts of our continent. It is a fact that in the absence of peace and security, our aspirations as a continent will remain a figment of the imagination. The people of Africa justifiably continue to look at and to this body as their Messiah to deliver them from abject poverty, disease, conflicts, and gross human rights abuses. We therefore owe it to our people to continue to evolve as an organization that can spur the confidence of the Af ordinary Africans by effectively responding to their needs. In this regard, let me also join my other colleagues in paying special tribute to the outgoing chairperson, His Excellency President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, for the sterling job he did during his tenure. Notable among his achievements are the successful launch of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area in July 2019, and the marshalling of the Program for Infrastructure Development in Africa, which is important, especially in driving integration of the continent. To conclude, I wish to take this opportunity to once again reaffirm my unwavering commitment towards the realization of the African Union Development Agenda for the benefit of our peoples and to wish you, Mr. Chairman, success during your tenure of office as the Chair of our Union. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Masisi. I now would like to request the Prime Minister of the Republic of Mauritius to address us. Mr. Chairperson, let me congratulate you for assuming the Chair of our Union. Allow me also to thank the outgoing Chair, President El Sisi, for an excellent tenure of office. It is indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to be back in this August Assembly of the African Union after the national elections held in Mauritius on 7th November 2019. I thank the African Union Commission for having deployed 
an election observation mission to Mauritius, thus reaffirming AU's commitment to supporting peaceful and democratic electoral processes. The observer team applauded the people of Mauritius for their commitment to upholding democracy and concluded that the elections were peacefully and professionally conducted. We welcome their observations. I have three messages I want to convey to my brothers and sisters in Africa. The first concerns the ongoing efforts of Africa to complete the decolonization of Mauritius. I am grateful to all member states of our organization for their unflinching support to enable Mauritius to exercise its sovereignty over the Chagos Archipelago. We are extremely disappointed at the failure of the UK to withdraw unconditionally from the Chagos Archipelago by the deadline of 22nd November 2019, as set by the United Nations General Assembly. Mauritius will pursue this struggle and counts on the continued support of the African Union to achieve its decolonization as rapidly as possible. Mr. Chairman, my government has committed to make of Mauritius a green, sustainable and inclusive economy and a robust jurisdiction in line with our Agenda 2063. Investing in clean energy, mitigating risks from climate change, protecting marine resources, providing quality education, facilitating access to health care, and improving the well-being and quality of life of our people will remain topmost priorities for my government at national level. My third message, Chair, is that Mauritius will continue to engage constructively with all member states, including the small island developing states of the African Union to move forward Agenda 2063. Capacity building is a key component of this. In this context, I invite the young people of Africa to avail of the scholarships given by Mauritius yearly to African youth to pursue undergraduate and postgraduate courses at various universities in my country. We believe that education, we believe that education is key to make our continent a sustainable Africa where guns are silenced forever. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. I now call upon the President of the Islamic Republic of Mauritania to take the podium. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa sallallahu ala nabiyyir. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Your Excellency, Cyril Ramaphosa, President of the Republic of South Africa, the current Chairperson of the African Union, Majesties, Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Your Excellency Musa Faki Mohammed, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, ladies and gentlemen. I would like, first of all, to extend my thanks and gratitude to the government and the people of Ethiopia for the warm welcome and uh, the generous uh, hospitality. And I would like also to congratulate the Prime Minister for the deserved uh, Nobel Peace Prize. I would like also to congratulate President uh, Simil Ramaphosa, President of the Republic of South Africa, for 
chairing the, the African Union, and I'm confident that his leadership and his wealth of experience will give a fresh impetus to our organization and our union in attaining its objectives. I would like also to extend my thanks and gratitude to His Excellency, President Abdel Fattah Sisi, President of the Arab Republic of Egypt, for the major achievements he, that have been made while he was chairing our union. My thanks are extended also to the chairperson of the African Union Commission, Mr. Musafaki Mohammed, for the efforts deployed in order to reform our organization. Mr. President, I'm honored to address you today for the first time from this place to reiterate to you that we in the Islamic Republic of Mauritania are committed to the achievement of the goals of Agenda 2063 and finding and realizing an economic, political, and cultural transformation in favor of a modern, prosperous, secure, and stable Africa. If we are not able to have sustainable development, we cannot reach a sustainable development without peace and security in our continent, especially in Libya and the Sahel region currently. Mr. President, the Libyan crisis is escalating and, is and its effects are growing, not only for Libyans who do not deserve the hardships they are and the sufferings they are living today, but to all the African continent and the uh, Sahel countries in particular. Therefore, we need to expedite or to speed up the endeavors to, to uh, resolve the situation. I would like here to commend the work made by the Committee on Libya, headed by His Excellency Sassoon Gesu, the President of Congo, that has flagged the complex and complicated situation in this country, this country and the growing dangerous nature of the situation. The G5 Sahel countries, in cooperation with its partners, has initiated a roadmap in order to in consolidate its efforts to counter terrorism and in order also to support its joint troops and also, and in this respect, sorry. The first General Assembly of the Sahel Alliance that will take place on the sidelines of the summit of the G5 that would be hosted by my country is all the preparatory works are under way. In addition to achieving development, we need also to achieve to improve our intellectual levels. And in this respect, the African scientists have met recently in order to promote the spirit and the culture of tolerance. And during this conference, there has been an appeal to uh, for the promotion and the prevailing of the culture and the spirit of tolerance in our countries, in our continent, in order to combat extremism, violent extremism, and, and fanatism that prevail in our African societies. I'm confident that my our continent is able to address all these challenges and to attain the goals of Agenda 2063. I thank you very much for listening. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, President. We now move to the last uh, uh, presentation before we break for, for lunch and before we end the open ceremony.
we want to get a presentation from His Excellency Ramtane Lamamra, the AU High Representative for Silencing the Guns, to come forward to launch uh, the African Union theme for 2020, which is about silencing the guns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Your Excellency, President Cyril Ramaphosa, President of the Republic of South Africa and Chairperson of the Union, Your Excellencies, Heads of States and Governments, Distinguished Heads of Delegations, Your Excellencies, former Heads of States and Governments and former leaders of the UAU AU, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. I am deeply honored to introduce the theme of the year to this August Assembly. Allow me first to commend the Chairperson of the Commission, His Excellency Musa Faki Mohammed, for his leadership on the theme of the year and for the objectives to be achieved. I would also like to commend Commissioner for Peace and Security, Ismail Shergi, and his team in the Peace and Security Department for their daily work on the theme of the year, silencing the guns, creating conducive conditions for Africa's development as reflected in the orientation concept note and in its matrix of activities. A similar tribute, well-deserved tribute, is to be paid to the other commissioners, deputy chairperson of the commission and department staff of the African Union Commission for their unwavering contributions to the multi-dimension task of silencing the guns in the continent, as well as to the members of the Peace and Security Council and indeed for our international partners. Looking at the achievements made in promoting peace and security in the continent in recent decades, particularly since the year 2004, with the operationalization of the AU Peace and Security Council, the noble objective of silencing the guns and ending wars in the continent is achievable. In retrospect, from around 30 active conflicts in 2004, we must celebrate the fact that we are now addressing fewer conflicts than then. I must state with emphasis that a lot of work has therefore been done and continues to be done to ensure a conflict-free Africa in line with the aspirations enshrined in the solemn declaration adopted by this August Assembly on 25th of May 2013 on the occasion of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the OAU AU and agenda and the adoption of agenda 2063. Indeed, Africa has a robust, a robust blueprint for promoting peace and security and stability as well as advancing a good governance, respect for human and people's rights and constitutions. This blueprint is the combination of the African peace and security architecture and the African governance architecture. The PSC has led and continues to lead effectively the implementation of this blueprint. This begs the question as to what else can be done to further enhance our concerted efforts in conflict prevention and resolution. Here, the determining factor is the political will of member states. Prevention and resolution of conflicts is done on national territories, and therefore, political will is very crucial. In other words, while the respect for national sovereignty is paramount, this should not undermine our efforts to scale up conflict prevention and if and when necessary, take collective action 
in the name of the principle of non-indifference as enshrined in the constitutional act of our union. Cognizant of the fact that civil conflicts are triggered by a series of disagreements, disparities within or between individuals, communities, and factions, we are faced with the challenges of being more creative in conceptualizing and implementing innovative solutions to conflicts in Africa. In this perspective, our focus should primarily be on how to ensure preservation of national unity, functional or functioning of state institutions and overall sovereignty of our people. In this context, it is imperative to conceptualize inclusivity in all facets of conflict resolution as one of the essential ingredients in silencing the guns in the continent. Put in the field, this means involving all layers of society, particularly women and youth. It is an established fact that causes of conflicts in our continent are varied and multifaceted. A significant proportion of those conflicts have been predominantly driven by ethnic rivalry over political succession, disagreement over modalities for conduct of national elections or over the outcomes of those national elections, as well as power struggles within the state. Conflicts also arise due to struggle over control and access to national resources and the accruing benefits. Furthermore, it is a fact that parts of the African continent are still facing struggles for national and transnational identities, and this can generate challenges to national cohesion. The consequences are manifold, ranging from deep shared hatred and distractions with their attended manifestations of mistrust, inequalities, and even risks of genocide, etc. While we continue to deeply or to deploy conventional methods of conflict resolution through processes that involve the use of wise Pan-Africanists, international and regional organizations, the involvement of neighboring countries, peace support operations, and civil society organizations, we should be cognizant of the nature, scope, and cultural settings of these conflicts. With, the, with this approach, one can then forge a tailored comprehend, comprehensive strategy, including the use of formal, formal and informal mediation mechanisms at the village, community, state, regional, and continental levels. In other words, lessons learned underscore the point that convention-centric approaches combined with inclusive local processes is more likely to contribute positively to silencing the guns in the continent. This is obvious. This is obvious in case of conflicts is instigated on the preservation of traditional social entities such as extended families, lineages, clans, tribes, religious brotherhoods, and ethno-linguistic groups, etc. In these types of conflict settings, there is need for a hybrid conflict management mechanism that will take into consideration traditional indigenous methods of interventions in search for a balanced solution between the centers and the peripheries in order to preserve national unity with due respect for diversities. The overall objective of this hybrid approach is the preservation of national unity without infraction on the existing religious and linguistic factors. Given the experiences gained and the results achieved in the past decade or more. 
the African Union needs more than ever to spearhead and strengthen its conflict mediation efforts and lead action aimed at more operationally bringing together all African and international actors, including the United Nations, in conducting enhanced collaborative efforts to silence the guns and create conducive conditions for social economic development in the continent. This should be translated into concrete steps to be immediately undertaken to silence the guns in Libya, in Mali, in the Sahel, Lake Shait Basin, as well as in the Somalia and other hotspots as much as possible in or during the year 2020. Africa has the will indeed and the ability to defeat terrorism as it has defeated colonialism and apartheid. The African people do expect such victory that will indeed lead to a permanent silencing of the guns in the continent. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize the need to review and adjust our conflict prevention and resolution tools in order to effectively and efficiently respond to the ever-changing nature of conflict, violence, and criminality on the continent. A number of proposals to this effect have been made this morning, and I hope that they will retain the full attention of the summit. I reiterate once more that silencing the guns is an achievable task that can help us to promote the sovereignty of our people and to further advance our Pan-African integration, unity and development objectives. I wish every success to your summit. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies. Thank you. That then speaks to the launch of uh, the AU theme for 2020, silencing the guns, creating conducive conditions for Africa's development. We'd like to thank His Excellency Lamamra for the presentation. This then brings an end to our open session. There is a moment for lunch now, and we would like to propose that uh, all of us can go and uh, have our lunch and return at 1700 hours when we will resume our closed session, which will go on until 18.30 hours, whereafter we will then have our dinner. So I am not about to overwork you, and all I want to do is an hour and a half after you have enjoyed your lunch so that we can get through our work. And bon appetit, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>